assistance, Ed Mullins and the board. We have New York City Lieutenants Benevolent Association, uh, President Lou Turco and the board. We have New York City Captains Endowment Association President Chris Monahan and the board. We have New York State Association of PBAs President Mike O'Meara, also the president of the MTA uh, PBA. We have from the Port Authority PBA Mike Mollahan, uh, Vinny Provenzano from the M MTA PBA, Executive Vice President. Jeff Gross, First Vice President, Nassau Detectives Association. Lou Dini, First Vice President, Suffolk Police Superior Officers Association. Ryan Law, President, PBA of New York State. Manny Villar, Vice President, PBA of New York State. Jim McDermott, Nassau PBA President. Pete Patterson, First Vice President, Nassau PBA. Ken Cortez, Sergeant at Arms, Nassau PBA. Myron Joseph from the New Rochelle Superior Officers Association, also representing NYSUPA. Tammy Sawchuk from the New York State Corrections Officers PBA, Executive Vice President. Frank Gilbo, Treasurer, New York State Corrections Officers PBA. Richard Wells, President of the Police Conference in New York State. Elias Hussamadine, President of New York City Corrections Officers Benevolent Association. Freddie Fusco from the New York City Corrections Officers Benevolent Association. Uh, representing Suffolk County Corrections, we have Will Fowler and Rich Lang. Brian Sullivan, President of the Nassau County Corrections Officers Benevolent Association. From the Westchester County Corrections Superior Officers Association, Bruce Donnelly. From the Westchester County Corrections Officers Benevolent Association, Neil Pallone. Dennis Quirk, President, New York State Court Officers Association. And Tom Mungier, New York State Troopers PBA President. I think that's it. Patty? You know, as we just watched, as our colleague listed off the names of the leaders and the members of practically every police, law enforcement, corrections union across this state, representing hundreds of thousands of citizens who happen to be police officers and correction officers and court officers and bridge and tunnel. One of the few times where everyone comes together knowing that we, as professionals, are under assault where the signs on the street are dictating the legislation that happens, but it's worse than that. We here in the city are doing this in the backdrop of a night where we had seven shootings in four minutes, eight shootings in five hours in different parts of Brooklyn not connected. Last week, 40 shootings, the highest since 2015. Homicides went from 5 to 13. Burglaries have quadrupled. You may ask why. Why now? How is this happening? How is this happening when we have so many professional, caring law enforcement officers out there on the street? And the answer is simple. There's been a message not only from our City Hall, but from the State House that says there will be a soft touch. And the criminals know it. And while folks were protesting, they were breaking down doors, climbing in windows, pulling out their weapons they're not afraid to carry. The hatred towards law enforcement is misguided. I have 36 years as a New York City police officer, and I can tell you this unequivocally. Not one woman or man that has a shield on their chest, a patch on their shoulder, 
regardless of what arm of law enforcement they come from, will support or defend a murder of an innocent person. And that's what happened. Let us be unequivocal. In all my time, I've never seen a time when not one law enforcement would support. Eight minutes is wrong. There was no struggle. There was no reason. So I know I speak on behalf of every police officer here. It was wrong. We denounce it, and we have from the beginning. We've had in this city violence on our streets, hiding amongst protesters. Folks that believe, that go out on the streets and bring their signs, we don't criticize them, we police them. We're protesters. I've protested. We've protested. We believe in it, we believe their rights, but now we're being guided by those that were intent on violence from outside our communities that threw the stone, that broke the window, that caused the violence, that injured 300 police officers, some viciously. That's who we denounce. And then, for our legislators, and I emphasize our legislators, to then demonize police officers as if we're the problem, as if we broke the window, as if we caused the violence. That is absolutely outrageous. We as police officers are citizens of this city, these counties, and our state. Our families live with us too. What we're seeing now in a rush to pass packages of bills in the dark of night without even reading them. Ask our legislators, have you read the bill? We've heard it before. They'll say they're busy. They'll say they don't have time. The bill is hundreds of pages. Well, it's your job to read it and know what it says. So the reason I say that is why aren't you speaking to all the stakeholders? You know, that's their word, the stakeholders. The stakeholders, our families, you know, the community, the stakeholders. Why aren't you asking the question of professional law enforcement? Why aren't you seeking our advice? Is it that maybe we'd be reasonable? Maybe we can see where the problems would be? Maybe because we're standing on that street corner with our fellow citizens, we know that they don't want this violence visiting their corners, but we've seen it. Didn't we just visit this problem with our legislature recently? Didn't they rush through bail reform? Didn't they have to admit they made a mistake? Why did it happen? It happened because they rushed it in the dark of night without speaking to, you know, the stakeholders, the stakeholders. They talk about transparency. Me too. We want to be transparent. You can only have transparency if you're being honest, having the discussion, having the dialogue. Defund the police department. Ask different folks, what's the definition? Get rid of the police? Defund the police? Shift the money around? It's a slogan. It's a slogan during a protest. I admire it because it's open to so many definitions. We went out on the streets to do a job. We went out in the street during this violence. We went out in the street because we knew we had to. City Hall asked us and ordered us to. And the brass put us out there. But then what we found out, there was no plan. There wasn't enough of us. We weren't up planning on stopping the violence. The violence visited us. We have district attorneys from all our counties, from many of our state, saying we will not prosecute criminals. 
who looted, not protested, who looted, who rioted. Our DAs won't prosecute them. But you know what's on the hearts and mind of everybody that has a shield in their hip pocket today? That who the DA did prosecute was a police officer whose boss sent him out there to do a job, was put in a bad situation during a chaotic time. And you know what? My gray hair told me it was going to happen. Everybody walked away from them. There was no longer a boss standing next to him like it was that night. The brass threw them under a bus, not saying it's our fault. We didn't have a plan. We asked them to go out there. The DA's to say, we don't have time to prosecute criminals, but we'll prosecute you. Talk about de-escalation. They're de-escalating their job. They're refusing to do their job. They're asking us to pull back. They're asking us to pull back. They're asking us to walk away from you. They're asking us to abandon our communities. They're asking me to walk away from where I live. They're asking me to walk away from where I work. They're asking us to walk away from the neighborhoods <clears throat> that we brought back. And that's what's happening. And you know what? We don't have a choice. If we put our hands on the criminal, you're going to jail. I'm not being dramatic. That's how bad it is. No one's read the bills. They're following the crowd. What's the joke? I'm the leader. Where's my people? Let me catch up with them. They're legislating <clears throat> by signs in a protest. We have our leadership who think they'll appease the criminals, who think they'll appease the rioters. They think they'll appease our critics. You know what my job as a New York City police officer is? When I put that shield on my chest, I put that patch on my shoulder, my job at that protest is to stand on my own two feet my job and your job is to make sure we protect your right to say what you believe as loud as you want, wherever you want. And we'll stand that line. We'll stand that line and protect that right. But when I'm standing that barrier line, what I don't have is a personal opinion. My job is to protect yours. So when we see our leaders tactically putting themselves on the ground, when we see our leaders joining the other side of the barrier, whether we personally agree or not, you're derelict in your duty. You stand the line. Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're angry, but it makes no difference because we stand the line. We stand the line on our feet, with our shoulders back, with our shield out saying, I'm here to make sure you're good. Now, if I want to go in across that line, if I'm the brass of this job that wants to jump over the line and go on the ground, then throw in a 28. Take your time. Go home. Change and come back and do it on your own time. Don't do it on the time of the citizens. Don't do it on my time. Don't do it on the backs of our members. And then when it goes wrong and a DA says we're going to lock you up, you should be standing next to them saying, I'm the leader. I sent them out. I should take the hit. I should get locked up. But don't hold your breath. We're not going to see that because they've walked away. I know many times when myself and my fellow union leaders take this microphone, folks think, well, they got to be a little bombastic and they got to be dramatic. I couldn't tell you how more serious I am. A while back, we had a press conference where we turned our flag upside down. I said, we're under distress. They said, we're under distress, and nobody listened. I don't want the neighborhood I worked in, that I brought back, that we brought back, 
I don't want it to slide back. Homicides, five to 13. Shootings, 40 last week, the highest since 2015. Seven shootings in four minutes, eight shootings in five hours in different neighborhoods in our borough. Disconnected, don't be fooled. It's not some gang guy running around town shooting everybody. It's separate incidents. Ask yourself, why do they feel emboldened to do it? Because there's no consequence, there's no cops, and we're held back. We look great in our blue uniforms. We look great when we're standing straight up on the corner. But the message of a soft touch means you look great, but don't get yourself dirty. You look great, but look like a potted plant. Some of the things I'm saying you've all heard before. Those of us that grew up in this city understand what I'm saying. That's the police department we left behind. We, in this city and state, are the most restrained police department in the country. The most restrained police department in the country. Ask Minneapolis if they're the same. We don't defend, we won't defend, we have not defended. I will defend those that stand here. I will defend my family. I will defend our citizens, both here and who are now in phase one going back to work. Why did the crimes happen? We're pulled back, we're demonized, and all the cops had to run to Manhattan, out of the boroughs, to stop looters. That's why it happened. It's my honor also to stand here with others that represent so many. And it's my honor to introduce Richie Wells to come up here, a man that is on the front lines with us for many, many years, and many of our police officers he represents. Yes, sir. Good morning. I'd like to address the uh, ramifications for every police officer in this state and nation on what's being done today in Albany and what's being contemplated in Washington, D.C. The message has been sent very clearly to police officers by our elected officials. We don't like you. We don't respect you. We will not support you. We want you to go away. And if at all possible, we're going to do everything we can to make that happen. That's the only way you can read the bills that are being contemplated right now. Police officers, because of this legislation, are going to be forced to choose between doing their jobs diligently, professionally, and competently, and doing the minimal amount necessary to maintain their employment, but also to protect themselves and their families. That's the choice they now face, because if they continue to do the job the way it's always been done, the way Pat just described it, they're going to be investigated so thoroughly, so minutely scrutinized, that they're not going to continue to do that. They can't, because no matter what they do, it's going to be wrong. They will then be the subject of an investigation, a prosecution, an indictment, and possible prison terms, simply for doing what they've always done and been trained to do. That's the message that's being sent. Unfortunately, our people are going to have to deal with that. They're your neighbors. Everybody that's listening to me right now has a friend, a relative that's a cop. We are not racist groups. We're your neighbors. We're part of your community. But you'd never know that by the way we're currently being portrayed. One incident in one area results in every cop in this nation being tarnished rational people discussing abolishing police departments and replacing us with social workers? I never thought I'd live to see a day like this. And all the cops are trying to do is protect the community and go home to their families at night. That's it. That's it. But under these new rules, is a cop going to chase an armed suspect? Is a cop going to look if he just receives a notification of somebody who just raped a woman and is still in the area, is he going to look for that person? Why would he? Why would she? Because any confrontation with anybody now results in some sort of physical contact, the cop is wrong. Police officers are now going to have to approach every contact with a citizen, no matter the circumstances, 
as that that person is a potential complainant against me in a civil or a criminal proceeding. Everybody's going to have to be looked at that way because that's what they're forcing our cops to do. They have made us the enemy of the community, and now we're going to have to look at the community with great suspicion that are they looking for help or are they just looking to cause an incident so that I can get in trouble and lose my job. That's not a good way to do things. It's not an intelligent way. It's not the right way. The right way is if there are incidents and laws need to be reformed, changed, amended, or new ones put in, that we sit down as adults at a table, compromise, discuss, and see what is the best solution for whatever the particular problem is. But that's not what happened. They were able to do this basically under the cover of darkness because we have not been able to directly lobby for our members in Albany because Albany shut down. But they're up there working, certainly not listening to us, and they're passing whatever they want. None of the bills that are being contemplated today or that were passed yesterday or will be passed tomorrow are initiatives that must be done right this moment when emotions are running high and people are not thinking clearly. Most of these bills have been around <coughs> excuse me, for many years. And the reason they haven't passed is because there are two sides to an issue. And things get discussed and modified, and let's talk about it. But now, there's nothing to stop them. Now, because of what's happened, everybody is up there and they're passing whatever they want. So we've been abandoned by everyone. We're it. The last line of defense for the police force in the street are all these guys, the unions. And now there's a movement to get rid of police unions because we're the bad guys. Why? Because we're looking for due process for our members. You know, 50A was enacted in 1976, and they made it, it's 50A, you never hear this, of the civil rights law. That's how important the state legislature thought of it in 1976. They made it part of the civil rights law. And the reason it was enacted was not to protect dirty cops, not to hide misconduct by law enforcement. Read the bill jacket. It says in there, the main reason that this bill is being passed is because defense attorneys were routinely pouring through police officers' personnel jackets for unrelated, unsubstantiated, irrelevant complaints that have been in there for 10 or 15 years, and then using that against the police officer giving the testimony in a criminal case that had nothing to do with him. He's testifying at a rape trial. It, officer, isn't it true 10 years ago you accused of being rude to somebody? Yeah, you were accused, but it was never substantiated. It was totally unfounded, but it's still in there, and the defense attorney got to ask the question, and they would do that time after time. Sole intent, discredit the police officer's testimony. Rapist walks out of jail or out right of the courtroom free, and the victim's sitting there going, what happened? That's why it was enacted. Now it's being repealed under false pretenses, that it's hiding police misconduct. 50A allows a judge in a criminal case to look at a police officer's personnel folder in camera and decide if it's relevant to the instant case, and if anything there is, it is certainly used in court. That's the way it's been. Now we have to get rid of it because it's inconvenient. The other bill with the, uh, the Attorney General now is going to be in charge of all misconduct. Any, any complaint of misconduct. Anonymous. Person says, cop did this, cop did that, walks out the door, that's in the cop's folder forever. Is that fair? That's what we were asking for in the 50A argument. Do not use unsubstantiated, unfounded complaints. No, they wouldn't even do that. So now this, this new Attorney General Board will look at any allegation of any offense by any cop anywhere at any time. Another level of scrutiny that is certainly not warranted. We have enough levels currently between internal affairs, the local district attorney's office, the state attorney general, the federal government. We're scrutinized. We are more than scrutinized. But again, we haven't had the, been given the opportunity to discuss these bills, as I said, none of which need to be passed right away, except that they're doing it for political purposes, to make themselves look good, tell everybody cops are bad, and then, yeah, now they want cops to go out and do their job like they always have. I don't see how that can continue. We're human. Self-defense is a very strong emotion and instinct. And we're going to protect ourselves and our families. So I'll just finish by saying, all the cops have left, as I said, 
these people, us, the unions, we're not going away. We're going to continue the fight, and we're going to protect our members' due process. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike O'Meara. I'm the president of the New York State Association of PBAs. And I just want to talk to, to, to you, the press, and I want to talk to the police officers. 375 million interactions with the public every year. 375 million interactions. Overwhelmingly positive responses. Overwhelmingly positive responses. But I read in the papers all week, we all read in the papers, that in the black community, mothers are worried about their children getting home from school without being killed by a cop. What world are we living in? That doesn't happen. It does not happen. I am not Derek Chavon. They are not him. He killed someone. We didn't. We are restrained. And you know what? I'm saying this to all the cops here. Because you know what? Everybody's trying to shame us. The legislators, the press, everybody's trying to shame us into being embarrassed about our profession. Well, you know what? This isn't stained by someone in Minneapolis. It's still got a shine on it. And so do theirs. So do theirs. Stop treating us like animals and thugs and start treating us with some respect. That's what we're here today to say. We've been left out of the conversation. We've been vilified. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Trying to make us embarrassed of our profession. 375 million interactions. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly positive. Nobody talks about all the police officers that were killed in the last week in the United States of America, and there were a number of them. We don't condone Minneapolis. We roundly reject what he did as disgusting. It's disgusting. It's not what we do. It's not what police officers do. Our legislators abandoned us. The press is vilifying us. Well, you know what, guys? I'm proud to be a cop, and I'm going to continue to be proud to be a cop until the day I retire. And that's all I have to say. Yeah. Thank you. I want to now introduce Elias Husamadeen from the Corrections Office of Benevolent Association to speak on behalf of his members. Every day, a correction officer is assaulted in these jails. Every day, a correction officer is assaulted inside these jails. Every day, we work with gang members who have communication with gang members in the street. 50A, my testimony before the, the Senate was, I don't think 50A go further enough to protect correction officers or police officers or law enforcement officers, especially today with social media. I don't think 50A go further enough. I don't want inmates with correction officers' information in their cells because that's where they're going to have it. Why should our personal information, our personnel information, be floating around a jail? It's dangerous. It threatens not only me as a correction officer, it threatens my family. My family information is in there. Every day, correction officers walk these tears, work these jails, work with the people that the police officers arrest that the DAs, that the judges decide that you don't want in the street. And now the legislator want to take the little bit of protection that we have. That can't be true. They want to take the little bit of protection that 50A actually provides, which I say isn't enough. 
Every day we don these uniforms. And I think Patty said a lot, and I think he said it best, but every day inside these walls, we have a different situation. We don't have somewhere where we could run or hide or duck or go. When it jumps off with us, it jumps off and we have nowhere to go. For the legislator to take away the little bit of protection that we have in 58, for them to decide that our information is going to be might as well say on the market. You might as well say it's, it's going to be bid. We're going to have inmates doing all kinds of things to stage situations to set up New York City correction offices. We're in a situation where people, we can't run. We're in a situation where every day, just the other day, a correction officer got his tooth knocked out. Another female correction officer, 16 stitches. Just the other day, a correction officer, female, hit in the head with a peanut butter jar and have a permanent scar in her head. And the legislators have decided that all of their information should be available in some inmate cell. Like Patty said, like the other brother said, we're demonized. Now, we're a little different from PD. We don't have bloods or blue blood. We don't have Chicago PD or law and order. When it comes to corrections, we have orange is the new black, all the odds. We're really freaking demonized when it comes to law enforcement. But I'm saying to the legislator, I'm saying to you, the press, I'm saying to everybody that's listening to the voices that we're saying to you, we deserve to be protected as we protect you. There's no way that we protect you and you don't protect us. Somebody needs to, you need to say to the legislator, no, don't do this. Stop making these backdoor deals. They're going to say, we spoke to you. Yes, I testified. Yes, they spoke to me. But they didn't give me a chance to say what I really think. They didn't give me a chance to really be at the table and say, no, I don't think this is good. I don't think this is going to work. No, they already made up their minds what they're going to do. What happened to George Floyd is a crime. But don't penalize correction officers, police officers, for what happened. Don't take the opportunity to take advantage of what happened and what's going on right now across the country to decide that you're going to further take away the protection, the little bit of protection that we have. Don't put the lives of our family at stake because that's what you're doing. Regardless of what you say, regardless of what the legislators say, you're putting the life of our family on the line. And correction officers, police officers, we deserve more. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, many times when I take this microphone, and I come here and I speak on behalf of our members. I kind of hear the talking points. You know, Patty, you're so angry up there. I wish I was angry. I'm heartbroken. I'm heartbroken because on September 11th, we saw our colleagues die and run into those buildings, and we were cheered on 10th Avenue. That's gone away. You know, we watched in Sandy where we jumped in the water, tried to save people, and we were cheered on the streets. It's gone away. During COVID, we went out in the streets where our leaders, our department, City Hall, didn't even bother to protect us by giving us a mask, but the citizens understood and they cheered us with the nurses and the doctors, and it's all gone away. It's gone away in five days that now we're demonized. I'm not angry. I'm heartbroken. They're heartbroken. When is it you see so many women and men that wear uniform so quiet, standing so somber? It's today, and it's at our funerals. I'm heartbroken. Questions? Yes, sir. I ask for my members the same thing, the same rights that you're entitled to, due process. Every union leader would say we fight for fairness. Bring the facts in. Give us our day. But to criminalize 
the job that we were sent out to do in a difficult time when we were under attack and that the job doesn't want to give us that due process where a DA says, I won't prosecute the wrongdoers, doers, but I'll prosecute you. All I ever asked for, and I say it time and time again, fairness, fairness for us, constitutional rights, constitutional rights for us, just like for you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If there's an allegation, invest the, here's what should happen. If there's an allegation, invest, investigate it, let the facts go where they go. But what do we see here in this city? We see a video, we, always the same words, go back on your tape. I don't like what I saw. I think he should lose his gun and shields. But then we're going to have an investigation. They got it backwards. Get the allegation. Investigate the allegation. Then decide guilt or innocence, not before. Yes. Yes, sir. What we're saying is we have to take all the circumstances into effect, the circumstances they were in, what was happening around them. They were sent out there. Their supervisors are next to them. We're asking for fairness. Review. We don't say no. Review. Criminalize it. It's absolutely wrong. It shouldn't be going on. What the first thing I thought is, wow, this cop's going to get demonized along with the rest of us because no one's going to take the time to look at it, review it, and quietly investigate and come to a conclusion. Because the minute it went up, the conclusion was made, and it was made by our leaders. That's wrong. Yes, sir. We've been in this police department have been reformed time and time again for many, many years, and that's being ignored. The problem is we want to come to the table. We haven't been invited to the table. The legislature has not invited us to the table to have a discussion. So do they really want reform? Do they really want compromise? Do they really want to, for us to tell us what it really is in the street and where we can help? That's not really what's happening. What's happening is the fever on the street has caught the fever in our elected leaders, and they're running and they walked away from us. In calm times, review and decide. What we're saying now is we're all demonized because someone was murdered in Minnesota. I'm going to say it again. Most restrained police department in the country. Yes, ma'am. My advice would be to sit down with us and have a rational discussion to see where we might be able to compromise if we can compromise. But we weren't given that opportunity. To ask, and what we would say is, we're entitled to the same rights as you. If there's a false accusation, an unsubstantiated accusation, if the person that made the complaint against us is found out to lie, then they should be prosecuted too. But they won't do that. But they want to expose everything, whether we're innocent or guilty. And then they want to say, well, where there's smoke, there's fire. Not always. Sometimes it's read wrong. We had that in a video that went out and a police officer took out his weapon during a riot situation. Take his shield, suspend them. My God, I don't like what I saw. Well, you know what we did? We did an investigation. We got the whole tape. Then the questions were being asked. Was the mayor wrong to say that? Why? Because a millisecond before, that person tried to kill a New York City police lieutenant. Now the narrative has changed. If we had done it properly, with due process, with fairness, that's what unions stand for. That wouldn't have happened. But unfortunately, time and time again, it does. I couldn't hear the last part. Thank you. Defunding the department is a slogan on a sign that has many definitions. You ask some, they, see, they say get rid of the police department. Some will say shift the money around. It's wrong. We don't have enough police officers. How does it affect the community? How it affects the community is we're not going to have police officers standing on your corner. Not just because of the defunding, not just because of the defunding, but because we've been pulled back from doing our job. Where you say to a criminal, we're going to have a soft touch. 
where a DA says we're not prosecuting no matter what's brought in here. Well, let's talk about what we just had with the riots. Why then, if the DAs are saying that we won't prosecute what you bring in, why did the bosses send this out there to make the collars in the first place? Who's left holding the bag at the end? Right here. If you didn't want us to do the job, then tell us. We understand. We won't like it. Our foot will be tapping because we want to go out and save the city. But we'll take our orders. We'll step back. But instead, we won't prosecute, but we're sending you out. What's the point? But they can wake up and prosecute a police officer that was in a terrible situation. That's just wrong. That's dereliction of duty. Yes, ma'am. What our police officers did, the message came from City Hall, a light touch, but we're out in the street getting bombarded with bricks, tennis balls with concrete, uh, uh, ice cream containers full of concrete thrown at us, barriers, you name it, you saw it. We had to protect ourselves, we had to protect you, and we'll do that. But the shame is they're not standing with us because their message is, why did the violence happen in the first place? Because the message came, cops aren't going to do anything. It's going to be a, a light touch. That's a message that's like putting gasoline on the fire. We're there, we don't want gasoline on the fire because standing between you and them is us. So we took the heat. I don't expect any police officer to get bashed in the head. I don't. I expect them to do their job professionally, and they do. I expect our leadership not to send out mixed messages to say there's going to be a light touch, but then send us out there? Ask the mayor that question. Ask the mayor, what was the message you're sending? Go out there, do the job, or don't do the job? Because I don't know. The boss man is saying, light touch. The brass is saying, get out there, do the job. That's a question for them, quite honestly. What is your message? What's the message now? What's the message now? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. In, right. In any budget, if there's waste and you can shift money, shift it. But what definition of defunding are they going by? If they want to take responsibilities away from us, they want to take vendor, vendor, vendor enforcement away from us. Anybody want to do vendor enforcement? Why did we get it? We get it. We got that job because no one was doing it properly. Mental illness. We don't want to go on those calls. It's an issue in society. But why do we get it? Because no one else is doing it. And the agencies that are supposed to do it failed. What's their answer? Give it to the PD. If they want to shift responsibilities reasonably, do it. But where are you going to put it? Who's going to do it? When you fail, who are you going to ask to step up? I got the answer. It's an unfair question. They're going to ask right here. They're going to come back and give it to the PD. Why? Because we do our job well. We do it efficiently. We do it professionally while the other agencies fail. Every failure on the street corner that we have to deal with, every 911 call is a failure of another agency that didn't do their job. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate, I appreciate the job that you're doing. I appreciate that you're here allowing us to voice our opinion. I appreciate it wasn't lost on us that while we were out there wearing our masks, trying to stay healthy. When we looked out, we see all of you guys there, too, helping us tell our story. I thank you for it. Thank you, guys. Uh, to, follow, to follow what my brother said, and you've heard it many times, never, ever apologize for being a New York City police officer, a Nassau police officer, a correction officer, an MPA, a state court officer, you name it. I'll say it every day. That blue line in the flag, that blue line on the sticker on the back of our car, that's not just a slogan, it's not just a line, that's you. Never, no matter how bad it gets, apologize for having a shield in your pocket. You know why? Because of you, I can do what I do. Because of you, I was able to rear my family in this city. Because of you, they can believe and love and pray where they want, with whom they want. Because of you. Never forget. God bless you. Thank you for your time.
Richie. All right. 